Okay, and this is part two, which is being recorded precisely after part one. Right, Minnie Ninjas? Indeed it is, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, we're not going to do this again. We learned our lesson last week with that. Last week? What do you mean? We're shooting this exactly after the last one. We look exactly the same. I'm going to need to actually look at the end of the video to see if you're wearing the same shirt to make that work. Absolutely not. That's the whole point. So, okay. welcome back. We're doing uh, part two. As we said, we wanted to put the two pieces together. So, we've covered volume one. We've gotten the bride all the way to the part where she's killed effectively two people on her list. That leaves three more people for killing. And then the namesake, you know, finishing off with the namesake of the movie, Bill. So, many ninjas, thoughts on Kill Bill Volume 2. All right, well, as you can see, we still have our copy of Kill Bill Volume 1 here. And number two, New Jacket. As for uh, the thoughts of the non sporting thoughts of the film, uh, remember how we said that it felt incomplete within the first bit, how it was set up there? Honestly, if this were a standalone thing on its own, even more so emphasized. Because a lot of it literally depends on knowledge of what happened in the first part of the film, or of the overall film, in order to get what's going on in the second one. And realistically, um, no, there were actually really only, uh, if I'm thinking correctly, only two people left on the list other than Bill. So for the most part, realistically, it was a whole two plus hours spent on killing three people. Yeah. Yeah, this definitely needs the first part of the film in order to make any sense. And to really get anywhere. And to really invest you in the film. Because it took quite a bit of time in order to get those three kills, I'm going to be honest there. Indeed. Now, I am going to make a point about this. Uh, still sticking away from the spoiler, we will discuss what actually happens in a second. But, just to make a point, we did state when we were watching the first one that it did feel incomplete. That's true. But also, we did also point out that you know, a lot of exposition was left out. Well, in part two, you got the exposition. You got a crap load of exposition. You got the background of how we ended up where we ended up. You got the background of a couple more things involving the characters. You got a lot more explanation to how the bride knows a lot of the things she knows, how she ended up where she ended up. But in much the same way, I use the example of a couple of the last Daniel Craig Bonds where two of the movies didn't operate very well individually, but then put together as almost like a collective, it actually comes off a lot better. It actually makes a lot more sense as a pair. Well, in the same way as the first one felt incomplete without the stuff we get in the second one, if you had just watched the second one standalone, you'd be missing out on a lot. But also, to be honest, the second movie by itself isn't really that good. If you if you broke them up and, you for, and we forced you to just watch one half of it, Volume 1 is actually a lot more fun to watch overall. Volume 2 is where we explain a lot, fill in a lot of the gaps, make it a complete story, and give us the ending. But as, as a standalone story in and of itself, it's, 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 actually not, it's actually the weaker of the two halves, for me, anyway. Just speaking for myself. All right, I believe we're done the non spoilery part at this point. Go for it. All right. It's. I'm not sure it's the weaker part in your opinion. I would actually go as far as to say it's the weaker part in fact. Because quite frankly, you need to see a bit of what's going on in the first one in order to make it on, make this thing make some damn sense. Because it's like the exposition that they included in all this film to explain exactly how well the bride had been, and technically how the first bit of the movie started there, was effectively to compensate for the utter lack of exposition that occurred in the first movie whatsoever. Or very little, I should really say, if we're going to be honest there. But of course, when it goes back to the present day, there really isn't a hell of a lot going on in the present day. Even the actual fights with the remaining people on the list are fairly short. Technically, she doesn't actually kill one of them. Uh, one of the other treacherous, uh, I think it's uh, Deadly Vipers is the name of the assassin group. Yeah, I think it's like Deadly Viper Assassination Squad or something along those lines. It's a very long title, 
Um, it's only mentioned once or twice, and to be honest, I think it's only said once, and I think it's shown on the screen once. Yeah, yeah well, effectively, everyone that's on this, everyone but Bill has a direct snake name, a snake code name, and Bill is referred to as Snake Charmer. Is Cottonmouth a snake? Yeah. Really? Every everyone, if you take a look at it, everyone is based or is named after some type of snake. That was the whole point of the fighting viper or the deadly viper's name. What was, everyone, what was Bud's Bill, name? Hmm? What was Bud's name? Uh, Bud's name was uh, Sidewinder. That's a snake too. Yes, I believe so. Oh. I recall hearing of a snake by that name. I didn't know. Well, there you go. Yeah, every literally every uh, one was. Except for Bill, Snake Charmer was named after a snake of some sort. So Sidewinder, aka Bud, doesn't even die by the bride's hand. Uh, Dude, no, it. stop! So, right there! Stop it! We already went by the spoilers. No, no, no. The spoilers are the part that I'm doing. It's like, let's, you know, we're going to get to all that. Yeah. But let's let's go a little chronological. If I may, let us start, let, 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 let me start us off and then we'll get where you're going to go. All right? All right, all right. So basically, uh, we start off with a mo- you know we start off with like the close up of Uma Thurman in her car, basically giving a quick like five second recap, getting us to where we're gonna go, basically saying, and then saying the movie tagline she's going to kill Bill, and then uh, she does right off the bat. The first thing they do is they show off the scene. She, they give us more from the wedding chapel. Um, from the wedding chapel when she was getting married to this other guy and then explains that it actually wasn't the ceremony itself but the rehearsal. And the rehearsal is where Bill shows up. Bill and Kiddo, which is the last name of the bride. So in the second half we get her name. So he ends up talking to her and she's surprised to see him in a way. Uh, And they end up talking to each other and she's trying to see if she can get, you know, Bill to play along with what they're doing. And Bill acts like he's playing along, whatever. Um, You know, they share some niceties. And then in the end, they pan back to where you see the assassination squad, go into the chapel, and then open fire on everybody. Which, you know, leads you, which fills in the gaps for what exactly happened leading up to the moment where Bill shoots the bride in the head, starting, starting off the whole chain of events. So that's where we're at. Uh, we fast forward over now. We have uh, we have a chance to see Bud, Bill's brother, one of the members of the assassination squad. Uh, Bud hasn't exactly kept up his uh, you know whatever skills he had. He had he hasn't exactly kept up. And as many ninja says, Bud isn't actually killed by the bride. I would like to point out before we go into any further, but I will let many ninjas take over after this. I want to point out that out of all of the people on the assassination squad. Bud had the best overall plan for dealing with the bride. In fact, his plan worked perfectly. Up until the part where, like, every single one of the villains in this movie, he refuses to actually kill the woman when he has her down. Uh, What he ends up doing is she's going to, as we progress through the movie, she is going after Bud. So her plan is to attack him with her sword in his trailer. Sounds like a good plan, except for the part where he's expecting her. As soon as the door, she flies the door open, she gets shot with two shotgun shells full of, I think, um, salt or what was it? Rock salt, I think. Rock salt, yeah. Which, you know, hurts like hell, takes her down, and he ends up smacking the sword away from her, um, you know, effectively manages to, because she is now more or less incapacitated for now, flips her over, puts a needle, that, puts a needle of, um, of serum or something that knocks her out completely. So she's actually unconscious. At this point, obviously you know, given the title of the movie, how this is going to go. But realistically, and this is always my criticism with a movie like this, I hate when a villain so obviously has the good guy done and refuses to actually do it and insists on doing it in an elaborate way for no reason. So in this case, Bud has her tied up incapacitated, rather than just chopping her head off and being done with it, he decides he's going to bury her alive. Great. Leads to more exposition, more exposition, and then flashback montage. Mini Ninjas, what is the flashback montage for? 
<laughs> All right, the flashback montage basically refers to uh, part of the explanation for the hand-to-hand combat skills of the bride, a.k.a. Black Mamba, a.k.a. as we uh, learn through the course of this film, Beatrix Kiddo, I believe, is the name given uh, for the character. Uh, basically, in order to get some additional lore to uh, try to learn the skills of uh, literally Pai Mei, uh, Bill convinces the namesake Pai Mei to take on Beatrix as a, as a student, of course. Okay, warning that... Oh, by the way, uh, he hates Americans... Uh, basically, he doesn't care about for much anything. He's going to basically hate you out of the start. But eventually, he'll warm up to you and teach you the things, hopefully. So, uh, in order to, before they actually begin the real training there, Pai Mei, after uh, insulting for quite a bit, literally says, You know what? Sh- I've heard you were at least had something to go. Show me what you have. And in a stereotypical old master fashion uh, from your traditional martial arts film, she gets schooled. And very badly. It's not even a it's a no contest there. How that goes. And may, the rest of the I next assist, little bit. May I assist you here with visual aids? Unless you happen to have a fake mustache, sir, I'm not sure how this is going to work. I have a picture of the person you're talking about. All right. All right. Hold on. Let me put it on here, and then I'll let you talk over it. All right. So I'm going to come back. All right. Yep. Let me do the old screen share dealing. I do have it here. So there's actually a scene, I believe the scene that he's referring to. So let's pull that up on the screen. There we go. Can you see that? Yep. I believe this is what you're referring to. Note the ridiculously stereotyped Asian master look that he's got going from the uh, long beard that is absurdly white. Please continue from there, Minion. Right. Well, uh, on a, well, I'll just take the moment to put this as a side here, or technically a note. Uh, Pai Mei is to this part of the film as Sonny Chiba as Hattori Hanzo was to the first part. Realistically, they were the best parts of their respective film. Let's be honest here. Especially with how they ended up dealing with it. So, this whole thing leads to a whole flashback montage uh, explaining with all the different training that the Bride had taken, or Beatrix had taken, under Pai Mei to learn his fighting style in order to become more deadly, which after the very long and arduous and painful training montage, brings us back to uh, the bride being buried alive here and using one of Pai Mei's techniques for basically like a one-inch punch to punch her way through the wooden coffin after she managed to untie herself enough and dig herself out from the six feet under and unbury herself. Yeah. That happened. Oh, and of course, uh, at that point, we go back to uh, Bud's trailer, along with uh, Elsa Driver, I believe? Well, uh, I think L Driver. I think no, E-L-L-E. L-L-E. I'm pretty sure it was E-L-S-E, but look. We'll get a little trick then, one second. Uh, I'm checking it right now. Keep talking. Basically, also codenamed California Mountain Snake, a.k.a. the one with the eye patch, where here's one of the things that Buffy is, right? It's supposed to be the whole fun pill revenge thing for the bride, but the mountain snake effectively in a, in a fake uh, fake out to buy the Hattori Hanzo sword, which Bud had stolen after burying the bride alive, uh, it turns out the suitcase of the money also had a very poisonous snake in there, a black mama, just for shits and giggles, so okay. She doesn't actually even get to kill everyone, and uh, Bud just draw, dies in a very unceremonious fashion. All right, now I want to make a comment about this. First, I'm going to fill in the gap that you were missing there. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is L, E-L-L-E. So it's L driver. Yeah. All right, now, this is the part that I took umbrage to. I did want Menon just to get us there, but now that we're there... So Bud, as I repeat, is the only person who legitimately, 100%, has the bride dead to rights. Like, literally has her dead to rights. All he has to do is finish her off. So, you know, as a result, he, in his confidence that he's already got everything well taken care of, he calls Miss Driver to get her to come out and buy the sword. Because she doesn't have one of these, you know, high-end swords created by this master. He presumably had one, and he left, led everyone to believe that he had pawned it. 
being that the sword is pretty much priceless given the quality of these samurai swords. Well, as it turned out, we'll, we'll, we'll reveal something about that in a second. But of course, being the geniuses that all these bad guys are, he is fully confident in believing that he's killed her by burying her alive, that she's dead by now, buried her into this grave that, you know, is in the middle of nowhere. She's obviously in the process of digging her way out of it as, you know, before this scene is even happening. Uh, so L, believing that he has in fact succeeded in killing her, decides to kill him and take credit for it. But not before she offered and agreed to his terms that she was going to buy the sword for, I believe he asked for a million dollars. So she brought a bag with cash in it. And the way she kills him with this bag of cash or this uh, suitcase of cash is that as he tries to count it, there is in fact a black mamba in it. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, so after that stupefying death, uh, of course, as she's about to walk away, it turns out, no, they, the bride had, in fact, managed to get back to the trailer during this time when this meetup occurred and promptly greets her former co-worker by kicking her or drop-kicking her in the face as she goes through the doorway. So now, just a point that I want to make just before you continue. My favorite part about these scenes every time they do it is that she is fully committed to this kick. What would have happened if she had just left the door shut? If she hadn't actually bothered to open the door? I'm sorry. I know the trailers don't necessarily have the sturdiest doors. But she wouldn't necessarily have sent the door flying. She probably would have been just as well off if the door had been shut. This requires some more forethought. And honestly, requires more thinking than this film is willing to give at this point. Because to be honest, uh, with the, ex ex I can't even talk the exceptions of a few specific scenes, uh, there, there was a lot of cop-outs in this section. So, you know, hey, how co convenient scripting. Hooray. All right. So, dropkick occurred. Uh, a fight, the first part of the fight ensues. Realistically, uh, Beatrice is at a disadvantage because she has no sword. It's L that has a sword at this point. Until she creeps around to another part of the trailer and reveals, hey, as it turns out, Bud never hawked his sword for cash. He left it in the trailer with him the whole time, although he was never seen using it. So now there because is a sword. he didn't need to use it. He actually had a great plan for getting her. And yep. he did get her. Yeah. So they now begin a very close quarters sword fight, but not before they do a little more exposition revealing how Elle had lost her eye while she was wearing an eye patch. As it turns out, she too tried to be the pupil of Pai Mei and basically lost the eye to Pai Mei after insulting him in such a fashion he felt fit to rip the eye out of her eye socket. Right then and there. But of course she got back by revealing that, yeah, she actually poisoned Pai Mei's food and killed him that way. So now, if we didn't have enough reason for revenge before, oh, you killed the Master Du? Okay. More killing. And method of death, although technically she was still alive to some extent when they left. Using one of Pai Mei's techniques, ripped out the other eye. So now you have... She doesn't eye. die. Like, realistically, you imply that she's in a lot of trouble in the stage she's in, bleeding, no eyes, and unable to see. She's actually left in the trailer by herself with the dead bud and the other black mamba. Yeah. Um... In effect, with no eyes, and her eye got squashed. Uh, but other than that, she L Driver is actually v presumably alive when the movie ends. It's implied that the Black Mama would have eventually got her, but of course, it was never clearly written in case they needed to do something later, I suppose. Yes, because it's going to be a great fight scene with her and no eyes. There are lots of martial arts films starring blind swordsmen boxers, so on and so forth. And most of them look like Pai Mei. Or uh, bold monks. One or the other. So which one does L Driver look like to you? Like the one that died in the trailer. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, go on. Please continue. Yeah. Alright, so now we have one guaranteed death in the trailer, one most likely death in the trailer. Let's be honest, she's not going to show up. So, really, now we have Bud, 
Or not Bud. Uh, we have Bill as the last target. All right, hold on. Before we go, let's not leave Bud. I'm still. I, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna stand up for Bud on this. I think Bud got screwed in this deal. It's like number one, he was the only one who actually had a good plan for taking out the bride. Unfortunately, he made the mistake that everyone in this movie makes. Good old-fashioned hubris plays into this movie a lot. Everyone who lets other people live pays the price for it. Like, it's very unfortunate, actually. And I think that Bud got screwed in this deal. Because in the end, he was killed with a friggin' snake. And why? Because L Driver wanted to take credit for it. Bud wouldn't have cared, really, if she had just left with the money. And then we probably could have gotten a fight scene with Bud or some sort. But no. Instead, he gets offed by one of the other bad guys. So in effect, the bad guys are so stupid, they kill each other to make her job even easier. In fact, they kill off the only one who actually had the closest opportunity to actually kill her. Yeah, no, that the whole Bud thing was stupid and everything. Technically, the one you felt the worst for in terms of the bad guys was Bud. He got because his life had been entirely shitty since that incident, as it made clear through the various scenes involving him. Although he was not a good person there, he was potentially the least bad person there. To be honest, he's the least bad person, including the bride. As yep. a good guy, I didn't feel bad for her at all. I was, I, I've seen the movie. I know how it ends. But if I was sitting there watching the movie in 2004, I'd be kind of rooting for him to have offed her. I would have been completely okay with that. I, to be honest, I found, I found Bud to be the most indirectly entertaining person in the movie. For, for, my, for myself, for my money. Yeah, right. So, yeah, okay. In order to get to the bill up to finding Bill, uh, basically Beatrice has to track down one of Bill's former mentors, which is best described as a pimp. The most interesting man in the world. At least in that part of the world. It's just a whorehouse. So, basically, short exhibition there. Which then leads to finally tracking down Bill's secret estate. Where in one of the screwier setups there, which they only vaguely go over, as it turns out, or, well, that's my mistake. No, they did mention it at the very end of the first half. As it turns out, indeed, uh, the daughter of both Bill and Beatrix was, in fact, alive. Pretty much born while she, I imagine she was still in a coma, and Bill had been raising her this whole time. Of dun, course, dun, dun. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, mentioning it, yeah, that uh, the bride happens to be her mother, uh, but leaving out the part. Oh yeah, at least until this point. Oh yeah, uh, she. The reason she's in a coma is like I, I actually did that. I enjoyed that Bill does tell her this. Yeah, that's and, realistically. And this kid does not seem remotely bothered by this. I'm just saying that this child, regardless of who had won the climactic battle would have been irrevocably fucked up. Yeah. So, the kid's already a basket case, it's becoming clear. A pleasant basket case, but a basket nonetheless. Uh, then we have one last conversation at the table where they try to air out all the things and air out the last little details of what the bride had done just prior to disappearing. So, more talking, and then... The actual final conclusive battle really took place while they were sitting down with the swords and ended like in a few minutes tops, maybe two or three minutes tops, and lastly with the deadliest of Pi Maze techniques. Are you, you're talking about the actual final battle? Yeah, the actual final battle. If that took two minutes, I would be shocked. It probably took longer. Like, I'm going to come back here. Yeah. The battle, per se, took longer then it took me to say this mini group of sentences about the battle. And it also took longer for them to talk after the battle was in effect over. Yeah. Yeah, what we're saying it was a non-battle. After all the build of the bill, Bill died in basically no time flat. And we saw more Bill, or the only way to really extend the bill to any real presence is maybe a little scene before with Bud and his appearance in the credits where he is lying down on the ground dead. Which, by the way, was a nice touch. Also, I would like to point out 
Bill had the legitimate opportunity. Bill actually shot her once with a dart, which presumably gave her truth serum of his own invention and his own creation. The exposition really was, like the last half hour of this movie was basically 99% people talking. Um, Bill explaining a bunch of different things, telling us a lot of stories, giving us, uh, you know, his uh, philosophical take on Superman. We got that. Um, you know, and his love of comics. We got that. And we also got the fact that he was such a great shot that he was able to shoot to prevent uh, Beatrix Kiddo from getting at his other sword. Um, once again, has the full ability to kill her. In fact, he, not only does he have the ability to kill her, he almost shoots her. He has the gun in a holster or to his side, and when he hits her with the tranquilizer dart, obviously, well, the dart with truth serum, obviously he is perfectly capable of shooting her. He is a good enough shot that he could have literally shot her a dozen times during the course of this final conversation and just been done with it. And also after he is, you know, defeated. And when we say defeated, he is defeated using the technique. Yeah. The, uh, I can't remember the damn name of it. It's like the five-finger uh, strike exploding heart technique, something like that? Yeah, it was this elaborate thing that was effectively, yes, that it would kill somebody within a few moments after they get up to walk away from you. This whole elaborate thing, which is all wonderful and great. Again, he's sitting in the chair when she applies this technique, and they're able to have a lovely conversation. It's very emotional. It's, it's, truly, uh, it's truly a scene. Again, he's, he still could shoot her. I, I'd just like to point out, he, he still could have shot her. He still has the gun in his holster when they're sitting there talking. He could just pull the gun out and shoot her. Anyone? And the, effectively, the only explanation given for that one is, if he did that, there would be no one left to raise BB. So that's the only reason he Who doesn't cares? do that. You're yeah. already going to be dead anyway. You're going to be dead within seconds of getting up and starting to walk away. Uh, effectively, the way that the the only logical, semi-logical explanation behind this is, uh, the winner got to keep the kid, and the loser died. That's the only s semi-sensible thing. And this movie, especially in on its own context, is stupid. <laughs> We've seen a lot of stupid films here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is stupid. In fact, this is so stupid. I'd say Seagal probably was asked to work on the film, and is like, you know what? No, this film is too bullshit for even me. You want to know, I think the problem is here, and this is where we have a little bit of fun. This is a fun movie if you take it as a whole. It's actually, you know, it's very stylistic. It's very interesting. It's very uh, visually, you know, intriguing. The music in it is great. The way it's directed, the style is very engaging. And the fight scenes that you did have, what there were of them, were, were pretty good. Some of them really short and some of them kind of anticlimactic, they did a good job developing some characters. Like, the characters had character. But you killed off the, the most interesting character for me of the bad guys in a kind of a dumb way. Um, your main character, I don't really care about her, to be honest. I don't care if she wins. I don't feel like, oh, you know, all is right in the world, the good guy won. No, not really. Mind you, I tend to veer more towards the bad guys myself. I prefer them. But in this instance, like, your good guy is sort of a bad guy anyway. It, Bill actually makes this point during this long speech. He's basically saying, you're a killer. Doesn't matter how you cover it up. That was actually the point of his whole superhero monologue, his whole uh, bit there. He's like, at the end of the day, you can cover it up any way you want. You're still a killer. You'd still be a killer. Did you honestly think that by putting yourself in this place with marrying this guy working in a record store and doing all this and raising your kid, you would stop being a killer. It wouldn't change anything. That was his whole point. And it's not like she refuted his point by killing him with the thing. And, and many, many Ninjas makes a fair point. You know, the, the, the only logical explanation is that the winner gets the kid. But if I'm standing there, I'm, I'm going to die anyway. You know what? I'm taking you with me. It's, it's like dumb decisions and hubris all over this movie. From beginning to end, everyone... There are no winners, because this kid's going to be screwed up anyway. I thought you were going to say you were going to agree with me the point that there was so this thing was stupid. I would have preferred that thing. 
because it was really, really, especially by the end, you, you basically managed to screw up all the entertaining parts in the movie to get here just because of how stupid and illogical the complications leading to the finale and uh, Beatrix getting the kid who doesn't seem to beat up over the back. Oh, that's that's my dad dead over there in the garden. Just lying there. Is someone going to pick him up? Maybe put him in a proper place? No, we're just leaving him to the credits there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's fine. Uh, oh, and we're going to joyride in the middle of nowhere, just cappy casually driving away uh, from the murder scene. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're good. I just think it's great that we still haven't established where it is she gets money to do anything. Like, at no point, she drives off with the kid in the stolen car, so be it, whatever, fine. But there's like a, there is a million dollars, presumably, or whatever amount of money it was, I can't remember. I thought it was it's, a million. I believe it's a million dollars. But she, as far as we know, she doesn't actually take the money. Who's bankrolling this? Who's paying she for it? Killing anyone and anyone with money. She comes across the way in order to fund these things. That's the only explanation. She has to be constantly killing people in order to fund this idiotic. So she's idiotic the bad guy. Them. So the bad guy won. The bad guy was Quinn Tarantino for making this film and making it so idiotic and stupid. <laughs> So would you recommend this film, Many Ninjas? If you were going for an intelligent film, no. As in terms of entertaining parts, the most entertaining parts, of it, as I mentioned, uh, were the parts that were not so much just kind of an homage, but a direct pastiche off of old martial arts films, which is what this thing was ripping off of for a, quite a bit. Did you say pastiche? I think pastiche is the term here. Is that the proper term? What does that mean? Basically, the case, uh, I might be using the term incorrectly here. Uh, we'll have to double check that if you could, please, Carlos. I'm going to try. I'm going to see if I can spell it. Uh, P A T. Hold on, I think I got it. P A. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Well, in fact, while Carlos is looking that up to see if I'm using the term correctly, the thing is, the things were, which were homages to the general martial arts and other films, this thing was clearly referring to. Uh, were okay, but the parts where it was directly ripping elements off, like Sonya Chiba's involvement as Hattori Hanzo, and the general setup there with the old master there, and Pai Mei as a whole, because everything Pai Mei did and acted as is straight out of old martial arts films. All right, hold Those on. Those were arguably the best parts of the film. And All right, most man, just hold on. Hold on, hold on. All right. Here it is. I have it for you. Right. The Merriam-Webster's Dictionary says pastiche. Mm -hmm. P-A-S-T-I-C-H-E, mm -hmm. something, such as a piece of writing, music, etc., that imitates the style of someone or something else. So it yep. looks like, in fact, you did use the word pastiche correct. And Excellent. now all of you know. All right. Just generally, the parts which were most deliberately taken off of other sources, just because they were done the most coherent, because they were so heavily referencing other stuff, probably were the cleanest parts of the film, and anything where they seem to deviate more and more from it and just kind of went into a stylistiness, not so much. And why all the talk? You were offering Rip Roaring Revenge, the whole thing, and you literally used it in the first few sentences of Volume 2, and you barely give us what you offer. There's almost no revenge to be had there. And it's so long and drawn out, and the actual revenge parts are so damn short, you just wash the whole damn thing away. And how does the bride keep funding this thing? By killing, indiscriminate killing of anyone and everyone she comes across, obviously to steal a few extra bucks to continue this very thing. What happened to the driver that drove them off of Bill's estate? You don't see him anymore. Why? Because he's dead. That's the only explanation. Because he was a witness. It's like, uh, why is my boss over there? There's a very good explanation for that. That's where he has a sword. You just killed me in front of your daughter. Yeah, uh, she's probably used to it at this point. Yay! You are a screwed up kid. Eh. I enjoyed watching his eyes bulge as he explained several <laughs> elements of this. It's 100% true. And if you look, like, my face is a little bit red because I've been kind of laughing in the background, to be honest. Look, bottom line, 
this movie is enjoyable in a certain degree. But you basically have to turn your brain off because some of it really is stupid shit and it is style over substance. Impressive style, interesting style, watchable style, definitely. But style over substance, 100%. A lot of talking, very little happening, especially for the second half, a whack of talking. Like you're, you're being, you're having this explained. The whole Superman analogy, the whole comic book tangent, the whole bit... David Carradine actually was quite entertaining and engaging in this movie. He really was very interesting as a character. Um, so, you know, in that sense, Quentin Tarantino did a great job taking a great actor, giving him some interesting things to say, and doing it. But even, like, throughout the movie, almost everyone gets an opportunity to have, like, a mini-speech. Uh, like, you know, L Driver there, when she's killing Bud... She doesn't just, you know, leave the booby trap of the snake inside the suitcase. He opens it, he gets bitten, and now he's slowly being killed by poison. Since he's being slowly killed by poison within the next couple of minutes, she gets to have this drawn-out speech where she explains why the venom is killing him, how the venom is killing him, what you have to do in order to save yourself from the venom is killing him, even though he is presumably paralyzed from the venom and is going to die soon anyway. So we're trying to establish that she's, oh no, she's, they're all bad guys. But she's really, really bad because she killed her fellow bad guy to take credit for something he wouldn't have cared one way or the other. He just wanted his money. And in doing it also, she was going to take the money, steal the sword, take credit for the killing, and then, you know, basically let him die in the slowest possible way. Why? Because she's a bad guy and she's greedy. So then she gets hers when the bride shows up. Okay. Because they're collectively tools. A lot of them are tools. And yeah. idiots. And then Bill has like an infinite number of opportunities to either kill her. They could have killed her when she was in the coma. Didn't do it. They could have killed... You know, Bud had the opportunity to kill her. He had executed the best overall strategy. Because in effect, she wasn't even able to touch him. In fact, she never was able to lay a hand on him at any point during this movie. <clears throat> she actually wasn't able to get him in any way, shape, or form, not even land a punch, a kick, nothing. All she managed to do was to spit blood on him. This will teach you, I will spit my own blood because I'm bleeding, but I will spit it upon you. That's because that's all she was left able to do. Which means he did his job properly, outside of finishing her off. Ye yeah. So, so, you know what? Good on you, bud. This movie's dedicated to you. You were you were better than this, buddy. You were better than this. Yeah, I think we're I think we're basically done with this film series. Oh yeah, no, we're done with the pair. Uh, I think uh, all that's really left is shameless plugging, and uh, you can certainly do that while telling everyone how soon you'll be getting your iPhone six and Apple Watch. We're going to be using the iPhone 6 and Apple Watch as bait for people. So that when they try to grab it, we pull them up in a tiny net. It has to be a tiny net. We take their funds, and then we will use their funds to do something that is a much better venture. Many ninjas, puppet theater. I have many puppet theaters. We're going to have that here. I'm going to take my chair over here. I'm going to set up some lighting there. Some Actually, some lighting right behind the camera thing. Set up the booth here, and then we'll have it so I can do my puppet demonstrations of the things going on in these mostly idiotic films we end up talking about. I think we could do a series on Steven Seagal puppet films. That could be a good place to start. I don't know if that's encouraging or discouraging. Think about it, folks. Steven Seagal puppetry. Now, it, it can't act any worse than the real Steven Seagal, although it will occupy a lot of uh, horizontal space because it is a Steven Seagal based puppet, which means it's not a thin puppet we're talking about here, folks. But I, I promise you, you kind of say he's fat. Its racist vision will be much more adorable. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so let's give the final verdict. The final verdict, I will say for myself, speaking for my end of it, it is entertaining. It is stylistic. It is style over substance. It is stupid as hell. It really is. However, if you can get the, the two-pack there, uh, relatively inexpensive, which you can, uh, it's worth a watch. 
Uh, but watch the two together because watching them individually will just leave you kind of confused. Regardless of which end you start with, if you just stop at the end of one, you lose out on David Carradine actually being pretty entertaining. You miss out on, I believe it's Michael Madsen being Bud, which is actually kind of an entertaining character, an interesting character. Uh, and if you just get two, then you'll have no idea what the fuck's going on anyway. And then you'll get also the... You'll miss out on the cool action sequences of one... And the a couple of entertaining characters in number two. Between the two, you get one reasonably interesting movie, long, albeit long, and you know it's it's watchable in that sense. You know, definitely give it a watch if you can. It's worth, especially for listening for the music and enjoying those action sequences when they do arrive. All right. Generally, if you get the thing as a full pair. And yes, okay, fine, that's not a problem. And I don't imagine it'll be too expensive at this point. But you're going to need to turn your brain off for a bit, especially with some of the bits, the exposition and such, and the excessive talking, especially in number two, because there's a lot of stupid things in this cars of the film. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy the film, but when you try to think about it, you'll hurt your head, and you'll need some aspirin. It'll be like you got a, pretty much got shot in the head if you really try to think about this too much. So don't do that. Just enjoy the enjoyable parts. Uh, enjoy the fight scenes when they do come up, even though some of them, especially in the second one, are really shorter than they should be, all things considered, especially with the film length. And uh, then watch some proper uh, martial arts-based films that are meant to be martial arts-based films and not overly stylized. Because you'll be definitely getting more fighting out of there. Listen, I will not have you besmirch the good name of two hours of exposition. Not two hours, but at least one and a half. It was two hours. Well, the overall movie was 217, so... No, I'm willing to give at least maybe one and a half exposition, and the rest, uh, flashbacks and actual action. That's there were certain flashbacks were better. Some flashbacks were better than others. Kaime was awesome. Indeed. All right, Men and Ninjas, shameless plugging. Go. All right, let's see. In terms of the video front, I'm still technically editing my fan expo footage stuff. I do have some video stuff that's from there and some other video things I'm kind of messing with. Uh, namely, I'm trying to see if I can get some proper input set up from my system directly uh, through my PPR in order to record things that way rather than uh, running off on and off emulator base usage just for the sake of having something a little more legitimate in the sense that it's being run off actual hardware. So that's something I'm kind of running in the background, and hopefully I'll be able to put some actual uh, proper usage of that and some, get some proper footage out of that soon. So, of course, I am ManyNinjas.com for more videos and updates for myself. Uh, at ManyNinjas on Twitter, which I'll be posting updates, including stuff that's going on here or there, any other random odd events I might be attending and such. And that should cover things for now. How about you, Carlos? All right, well, for myself, I'm about to bring it back over here. One second. Uh, so for myself, it's the usual. It's uh, at Carlos Algazar 2, where I do update these things. Uh, CarlosAlgazar.org, where I'm going to be adding the latest, including one post that will include both Volume 1 and Volume 2 of this set. Um, you know, that's where it will be. I was actually going to wor start working on some of the other video ideas that I've been thinking of. I actually was going to do that. I woke up this morning, and I'm not sure if I pinched a nerve or what I did, it actually kind of hurts to move my shoulder. Um, so I'm going to try to fix that, and then after I do that, then, then I'm going to get back to working on the ideas that I had. Um, I'm thinking of doing a little video series similar to what we're doing here, but it's going to be just, you know, quick standalone reviews, but the beauty of it is through the power of editing, I can keep them down under 10 minutes, a lot shorter. It's going to be mostly straight to DVD and stuff that I pull up on Netflix, stuff that mostly didn't get to theaters. So I'll give that a try, and if I can make it work, I'm going to work on it. We'll see what I can come up with, and if I'm happy with it, well, then I'll end up posting it on. I'll keep everybody posted at these places. Uh, so that'll be it for us. Um, next movie. I, I was trying to decide. We had figured out which movies we were going to do next. We hadn't figured out the sequence of them, to be honest. But I think let's have a little fun. Let's do another movie that, again, is a style thing, but I do think there's a little bit more substance to it myself, but we'll see. You know, we'll figure it out. We're going to do a movie starring, I believe it is, I'm going to quickly pull it up, just bear with me for two seconds. 
I'm going to pull it up right now. I believe it stars Batman. So let's take a look. Which of the several? Most recent Batman. Batman. Christian Bale. Christian Bale? Yes. Yes, it is. All right. Just wanted to double check. I was pretty sure. All right. So it will star Christian Bale as, you know, basically, uh, I guess, a, a cop from the future, more or less. Basically, is what they're trying to go with, sort of. Equilibrium. Uh, yeah. Basically, a poor man's matrix, if you will. Or maybe a rich man's matrix, depending on how you really feel about it. But there are some comparisons that can be made, and that'll be the next one we're going to do on the Action Movie Show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and comment. Unless you're coming and talking about how this is not the actual movie. To which case, please keep your thoughts to yourself in that case. Also, let many ninjas know in our comments section or directly through Twitter how, you know, which you'll be getting. iPhone 6, iPhone 6 Plus, the Apple Watch, and which one of these things you think many ninjas should use for his future reviews. And Bates to steal people's money to begin my puppet empire. Or buy myself more video games, because let's be honest, that's probably what I'd be doing if it wasn't for the puppet thing. It'd be one or the other. I'll try to work out a good percentage. We'll set up a Patreon thing. It's video games and puppets. I wonder how well that would actually go. We have someone I'll, who I'll did a Kickstarter for... I'll give you 50 cents. Hey, just keep in mind, we had someone that... I believe used a Kickstarter or was it Indiegogo to set up a potato salad and they got like ten thousand plus dollars for that. In actual dollars. It did not get canceled. I feel, like this, was, I feel like this is a, an entire other video we could do. We're gonna talk about this offline because I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm intrigued. I'll see if I can find the link. Alright. All right, guys, so that's it for us. As, as the ninja has said, you know, if you want puppets, put it in the comments. Why you would want them, you're sick in the head, clearly. Maybe you were watching the end of this movie and thinking about it a little too hard. In any event, we will see you next time. Have a great one. Say bye, men and ninjas. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. Potato salad. Potato.